The book of 1 John chapter 3 is where we are in our study. And again, I just want to say to you that John wants his people to know that they are in the family of God. He wants them to experience security. He wants them to experience assurance that they are indeed a part of the family of God. He wants them to know it in their heads, but also to experience it, to feel it in their hearts. So he provides two ways to test for it, two ways to evaluate, am I really a child of God? Both of these tests are tied to the character of God. The character of God, the attribute of God, that He is holy, that He is light, and He is love. God is light. He is righteous. He is pure. He is holy. And God is also love. And so the way John's logic works is that since God is light, His people should be as well. That's his concept. Because of the nature of regeneration, the fact that True believers have been born again. They've been transformed by the gospel. John believes, God is saying, that if we are children of God, we will manifest the light. We will desire by His Spirit to walk in truth, to walk informed by the Word of God. Moreover, since God is love, you might say again, so are His people. Since God is love, His people will also manifest His love towards other people. So these past two weeks, we've been talking uh, together about the kind of love we're talking about. What is the kind of love that John is talking about in uh, his letter? This is an important question because we live in a world that uses love broadly. In fact, even the New Testament uses the language of love uh, in different ways. So what kind of love are we talking about here? Well, in 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, glance down at it if you would. I think we have four descriptions of the kind of love John is talking about. The kind of love that God is and puts in the heart and life of every true believer. The first two we talked about last week. First of all, the love that is super. It's a love that is not normal. It's supernatural. You can see it in the language of verse 16. By this we know love. You might say it this way. This is the only way we know love. This is how we know love. What is it attached to? That he laid down his life for us. What John is saying to us, not only here, but also in context, is that we don't know this kind of love apart from God. We don't know this kind of love apart from his gospel. We don't know this kind of love apart from the cross. So, again, understand, my friends, that we're not talking fundamentally here about a change in behavior. Right? We're not talking about turning over a new leaf. We're talking about regeneration. This is not behavior modification at a fundamental level, but new birth, regeneration, God transforming our hearts. We're talking about a transcendent love, my friends, that was first displayed to us by Christ and then put into us by His Spirit and is worked through us to other people by His Holy Spirit. Just consider what Paul says to the Romans again. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Paul says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit of God has been poured into us and with Him, the presence of God's love. He's in us. But this is not normal. Okay? The love we're talking about, it's not natural. It's supernatural. It's super. Number two, it's a love that is selfless. Note your text, verse 16. By this we know love, this is how we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. It's a love that is selfless. In response to the love that we've been given by Christ, that's been modeled for us in Christ, John says we ought to give that same kind of love to each other. It is a self-sacrificing love. And this is radical in our culture. Our culture that is very much self-absorbed, very much self-focused, very self-centered culture. It's always been that way from the beginning of time. But man, it's obviously that way even now, is it not? 
We live in a very self-absorbed, very self-focused culture. So this is radical. What we're talking about here is radical. It's a selfless love. But my friends, it's ultimately the only way really to live, I would say to you. And I think we'll see that even as this text unfolds for us uh, this morning. So the love that John says that should be present in the lives of believers is a love that is super and a love that is selfless. But it's here that it's almost like John instinctively knows that he has to make a couple of points of clarity, a couple of points of clarification. Um, First of all, I think he knows that we might be too quick to just sort of nod in agreement as if we've got it, right? Have you ever been teaching a little kid, maybe academically or in sports or something like that, and you know that what you're teaching them is a little bit complicated and they haven't gotten it, but they are signaling to you that they have it. You know what I'm talking about? Really quickly, they're like, got it, got it, got it. I'm good, good. Dad, mom, got it. Need no more help, right? And you know they don't have it. And perhaps sometimes you, you let them get into it a little bit, right? Before you coach them up some more. I think this is what John is doing a little bit here. He knows we don't quite have it yet. We need to think about it in a more practical way. But moreover, I think he also knows that some of us will be sensitive to what the Spirit of God is doing in our hearts and going, like, how do I do this? How do I apply this practically, this supernatural love that God has put into me and this selfless love? Like, what's it going to look like in our daily lives? With that, I invite you to look at verse 17. Please look at verse 17. John here says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So what does this super selfless love look like in practice? Number one, I would say to you, it looks like a love that sees. A love that sees. If you note your text, he says, if anyone has this world's goods and what? And sees his brother in need. Now right here at the outset, let me just make a simple point of clarity. You might be asking to yourself, as we seek to apply this, who am I really responsible for? Who is my brother? We can talk a lot about that, but I, I want to just simply point out that I think the language of seeing is important. I think what John does, not only in this verse, but also in the next one, is tighten the scope, tighten the window of application for responsibility. I think it's easy sometimes to come to texts like these and apply it too broadly, to think about all the needs in the world, or maybe even all the needs in the city of Lincoln, and to feel like, man, there's no way I can make a dent into that. Well, John's really not talking about the world. Okay, he's not really talking about the world. For you personally, he's talking about your backyard. Who are you responsible for? Who is your brother? I think very simply, they are the people that the Spirit of God leads you in your daily life to see, to come across. You remember what Jesus said when people asked him, who is my brother or who is my neighbor, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. Each of these people encountered someone in their daily course of life. They encountered someone who had a need. Very simply, as you think about applying this in your daily life, don't think the world, don't think even about the city of Lincoln. Think about your neighbor. Think about your family. Think about people in your house. Think about people in your sphere, uh, at work, co-workers friends, people that you come across on a daily basis, the person you get your coffee from, or maybe you buy your gas from, the the lunch joint you frequent. These are the people that John says, you and I need to see, for love has eyes. My friends, love has eyes to see. Now, embedded in this statement, he who has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, is the understood reality that brothers and sisters in Christ will see one another. They will see people 
that do have needs. It's like John assumes this reality. He assumes that you and I are going to come across people on a regular basis that we will see have needs. Now, I need to pause here and make a point of application. Because I think we are dealing with something in our day that perhaps wasn't as relevant a point of application in John's day in the first century. And I think they circulate around two things. Number one, distance. Number two, distraction. I think we are far more distant in our culture today and far more distracted. Distant in the sense that we don't live in the same way that they did in the first century in a typical way. In the first century, life was arranged around community. They lived much closer together. And I don't talk about this point with any like disdain upon our culture. I don't think our culture is bad or misinformed in some way, but it is different. It is different. We tend to live more spread out. We tend to live more isolated. We can go to just Walmart, right, and get what we need for the day. In the first century, life was much more community-oriented. They sort of needed one another and the goods and services that they would provide as, as a calling, as a career, to live, right? So they were in close proximity. Their houses were close. They were mostly outside. They were exchanging goods. They had opportunity, occasion, to see people a lot, to encounter a lot of needs. Just consider that for a moment, but also consider the reality of distraction. We are far more distant, maybe not much of a problem per se, just something we need to be intentional about, thinking through, but I think we are also far more distracted. You know, something that they didn't have in the first century? They didn't have a cell phone. When they were walking around, when they were engaging with one another, when they were waiting on someone, it wasn't a quick like, let me pull up the news. Let me pull up my feed. It just wasn't there. So I think it's important for us to think about this and not just hop over the language of seas. John sort of assumes it in this text. I don't think we can assume it. I don't think we can assume it. What we're talking about here with regard to love having eyes, we're talking at a level about intentional sight. So question, do you live this way? This is a perspective of life. Do you live with your eyes up? With your eyes up? Do you leave your house on a regular basis with your eyes up? Maybe with a prayerful heart. God, would you lead me to someone today that has needs? Would you show me someone today that I could encourage? Would you show me someone today that I could help in a tangible fashion? We are far, far too easily distracted. And we become, even unwittingly, I think sometimes, very self-absorbed. So what is John saying here? I think what John is saying is that true love has eyes that are connected somewhere. Eyes that are connected to another organ. Connected to the heart. Spiritual eyes to see people's needs. Are you living this way? One of the most profound experiences that I had in my early 20s that I think about often was a time, and I think it's relevant here, a time in which I was sitting at the local Wendy's in Bedford, Virginia. I was a youth pastor very early in youth ministry, in my early 20s. And I was sitting at Wendy's waiting for a friend who was uncharacteristically late. I was sitting there, and at that time, I had a flip phone. I didn't have, you know, a phone with all kinds of apps and my email and stuff like that. We could text, but in those days, we didn't really text. Okay? I remember getting my first text and thinking to myself, what in the world is that? And I ignored it for like three weeks. It was one of my good friends that, that lived in a different state. But anyways, back then, I, I wasn't accustomed to just pulling out my phone. I remember sitting there in Wendy's, and there was a, just a few people in uh, the establishment there, but I remember immediately noticing an older woman about three tables down. And she was in her 80s, I'm guessing, white hair, very cute. She was sitting there eating a baked potato. And I remember when I saw her, it was like the Spirit of God immediately started to talk to my heart, to speak to my heart, not audibly, but He was speaking very clearly to my heart. I remember thinking to myself, this woman is sad. 
I could just see it. It was written all over her face. This woman is sad. And immediately the wrestle began. Because it felt like the Spirit of God was saying to me, you need to go encourage. Like, you need to go talk to this woman. And I sort of instantly suppressed that. There was another couple over here, and I just thought to myself, this is going to be weird. I don't know her, right? I don't want to speak up in this moment. Much easier just to sit here, right, and wait for my friend, and he's going to be here any time, right? As it turned out, he didn't show up for like 30 minutes. And thankfully, the Spirit of God won. And at one point in time, a few minutes in, I simply said to her, very profound, I said to her, how was your baked potato? <laughs> it's true. It's just truth. That was all I could think of, of saying. How was your baked potato? And I'm just telling you, friends, when I said that, her eyes lit up. They just lit up. And she just started talking to me. And I ended up scooting down closer to her. And she talked to me. I didn't hardly say any more after that. She talked to me for like 30 minutes. But she began to unfold her life and told me that in that past year she had lost her husband she had lost one of her sisters and one of her best friends she was lonely it was about christmas time and she said to me that she hated the thought of going through christmas all alone well about 30 minutes later uh, my friend did show up and i started to get up to leave I gave her a little hug, and as I pulled away, she kind of tugged at my shirt. And she looked at me and she said, I think I'll make it through this season thanks to you. Now think about that. I sometimes just even get a little bit emotional thinking about it. The thing that's fascinating about that story for me and compelling about that story for me, a couple of things. Number one is that I did very little there's nothing really praiseworthy about me in that. Other than that, the Spirit of God won out, and I said, how was your baked potato? That's it. But in that, the Spirit of God displayed through me to her that I cared, at some level that I cared. And this woman needed someone to talk to. She needed someone to bear her heart with, to bear her soul with. And I just sat there and listened. I didn't do my, very much at all. I think sometimes we overthink stuff. Like, do I have a speech prepared? You don't need a speech. You just need a heart that cares and the Spirit of God to lead you. But the thing that I wanted to say to you today is this. I wonder if that would happen for me today. I wonder if God has, even in the past months, given me opportunities like that that I've missed because I've been sitting there waiting and not looking, but scrolling. Constantly looking down. Because that's my instant reaction, right? I've got time, if I've got space, pull that baby out. I wonder if today I would have been like halfway through an email or a text thread or checking on the news or whatever. I wonder if I would see. My friends, real love, the love of God flowing through us has eyes. Eyes to see. But true love also has hands. True love sees, and it also serves. Check out your text. As John continues, he says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Love sees needs, but also seeks to meet those needs. Love has eyes. Love also has hands. So there's this guy that sometimes my kids and I watch on YouTube, and he's ridiculous, but I think he's fantastic. Our kids think he's, he's hilarious, and basically what he does is he chugs things, and it's pretty crazy. Like, he, he will chug like 20 Cokes in like 30 seconds. <laughs> it's so unbelievable. It's totally ridiculous. My wife watches us when we watch that, and she's like, you guys are ridiculous. But we find it funny. But his, his main line, like his signature line is this. At some point, he set up the whole scene, like he's got 20 Cokes put in this giant boot or whatever. He's got the whole thing set up. And he goes like this every time. He goes, enough talk. Let's do this. Enough talk. 
Let's do this. That's what John says. Look down at your text, verse 18. Enough talk. Let us not love in word or in talk. Like we can all do that. Probably we're really good at talking. John is like, I want to know about your doing. Are you doing anything? Are you stepping out in any way? Talk can be cheap. Words can be easy. John says, enough talk. We've had enough pontification. What are we doing? For love has hands. Love, true love, acts on what it sees. So question, what do you think John has in mind? Well, the text makes it clear if you you look at it. The text makes it clear that John has in mind very specific, tangible needs. Again, this is why I'm saying John tightens the focus for us. This is not fundamentally about this church solving the world's problems. This is about you and I as individuals in our sphere of influence acting on what we see as the Spirit of God brings us into an encounter whereby we see needs God is saying, look, step out, say something, do something, write the check, make the meal, engage, right? What are we doing? I know what you're saying. I know what you're singing on Sundays. What are we doing? How are we engaged in the mission that God would have us be on? Perhaps John has in mind a gift of money intended for a brother or sister or family in need, pay a bill buy some uh, clothes for their family or, or food. Perhaps he has in mind the gift of sharing food or clothing. That you have plenty and you could share with someone who has none. Right? Perhaps John has hospitality in mind. That you are opening your home. Someone has the need for a place to stay or someone has the need for a place to room for a night or just for a simple meal. Perhaps he has hospitality in mind. Perhaps he has the sharing of skills in mind. Um, Like, for example, when you have someone like me who has like zero mechanical skills. Perhaps he has those in mind that have mechanical skills that could help people like me, right? Um, Seeing needs, meeting needs. I've often humorously, I've I've told this to Catherine before, I've often humorously said that when we passed people on on the side of the road, and there's that urge of the Spirit, like, I could help, I could stop and help. Um, I've thought many times, and I, I would actually like to stop and help, but I would probably be more of a problem than a solution. I would be right there, like, looking at the engine going, mm, and someone eventually would be like, you can go. <laughs> you can go. So there have been times in which I've stopped, and I've said, do you have a cell phone, like, to make a call? <laughs> Just to make sure, but... Yeah, bottom line is people have skills. Perhaps he has that in mind, that you could share the simple lending of a hand. What he does have in mind is tangible, right? He's talking about a tangible need that the Spirit of God brings you across, and you could pull out the checkbook. You could make a meal. You could open your home. The question is, do you respond? Do you respond? Do we live a life that is heads up, eyes up, looking out, and then eager to respond in the moment. John says, this is what Christians ought to do. This is what Christians ought to do. This love is what should mark our lives. The question is, what if it's not here? What if this love is not here? What does it say about that person? Again, note the language of the text. What does John say? How does the love of God abide in him? Abide in who? So to close your eyes, to be willfully blind to the needs all around you? John John is saying, where's the love in that? Has Christ's love really entered your heart? To pocket your hands? To choose to say no to the opportunities around you? John says, how does God's love abide in that? So, friends, if your routine, think about it with me, if your routine is to be oblivious to 
or inactive to the needs all around you, if your eyes are shut and your hands are closed, can you really claim to be a Christian? That's the question that John straightforwardly lands. Can you really claim to be a Christian? Or he is saying this life that is simply absorbed and consumed with self is incompatible with Christ. It's incompatible with Christianity. The way that most people live, it's not the way that people who've been born again live. You might say, why? Just a couple of points of application drawn you know, from this text in context as we conclude. Number one, because it's incompatible with what we've been given. To live that way, eyes down or eyes inward or willfully closed and hands pocketed, incompatible with Christ, incompatible with Christianity, first of all, because it's incompatible with what we've been given. What have we been given? You note the text, again, John says, the person who has the world's goods, who has the world's goods. Moreover, in verse 18, he says, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. Let, let's love truly. Let's love truthfully. What have we been given, my friends? We've been given so much. It's clear that even just at a physical level, John is assuming that there are plenty of folks in the community who have more than enough to share. More than enough to share. The question he has for them is, are your eyes up? Are your ears open? Are your hands out looking for needs and looking to meet those needs? We're not even talking about like deep sacrificial giving. We're talking about what's most often giving of excess because we've, we've already eaten, right? We've already paid our bills. We're talking about just seeing, simply seeing and responding to needs. We're not talking about someone being reluctant to share one of the like three and a half peanut butter M&Ms in those little packets. You guys know what I'm talking about? That you might get trick-or-treating. Those things are ridiculous. It's just a tease, right? You can't just have one of those. A serving is like 10 of those, right? Am I right? When I, when I see my kids open one of those, I feel bad asking for, for one of those. But if they open one of those big party bags, you know what I'm talking about, of peanut butter m and I'm going to take a few. There's going to be a dad tax on that, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But just think about a five-gallon bucket full of peanut butter M&Ms or a swimming pool full of peanut butter M&Ms. The reality is, listen, now you're hungry, right? The, 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 the reality is, we are rich. In comparison to the world, everybody in this room, everybody in this room is relatively rich, relatively wealthy. We have so much, so much. We have swimming pools full of M&Ms. How dare we, this is John's thought, how dare we be so miserly to not flip out a few to other people? This is the idea. How dare we be so like Ebenezer Scrooge they just want to hoard it and keep it in. I want more. I want another swimming pool full. This is the idea. God says you could share. You have so much, guys. Ladies, we have so much. We could share. The question is, do we see and respond? John's thought is the Christian has been freed from a mindset that is just totally on the things of the world. The Christian's been free from that. Christian understands where resources come from and what they're for. Listen, please hear me. I want to be very clear. Because I, I can sometimes get annoyed by some people that get on tangents like this. It's, there's nothing wrong with having a nice house. Nothing wrong with having a nice car. Okay, please don't feel like I'm just pouring on a guilt trip. If you have a cool phone or something like that, it's fine. But I am saying, each of us, each of us, should be evaluating our lives. Where are our priorities? 
where are our priorities? Um, maybe, maybe, if we allowed the Spirit of God to evaluate those things. God, what should I do with this extra money? What should I do with this? Should I invest in another 401k? Should I invest in another addition or whatever? Or, or who could I give to? The Spirit of God. My friends, the Spirit of God will lead you. Just think about it. Pray about it. Ask the Spirit of God to show you some needs, some opportunities to use what He's blessed you with to bless other people. Consider what Paul told Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, 17-19, he says, As for the rich in this present age, which again, we all fall into at some level, he says, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Don't be proud about what God's blessed you with, and don't set your hope in that. But rather, understand where it came from. What does he say? He says, fix your hope on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Again, nothing wrong with enjoying life and enjoying what God has blessed you with. Just don't fix your hope there. And don't let that be your number one priority. He goes on to say to Timothy, they are to do good, to be rich, wealthy in good works, to be generous, ready to share, eager to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. That's perspective. Okay, perspective. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Here Paul speaking again. It says we must, there's a deep motivation here, help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. To live a life that is just miserly, an Ebenezer Scrooge mentality, this is incompatible with Christ. It's incompatible with what we've been given. But then secondly, it's incompatible with who we've been given. With who we've been given. Consider the life and testimony of Jesus. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 and 36. What a powerful, uh, really, summary of Jesus' entire ministry. Just think about the life of Christ. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. His life was consumed by others, consumed by seeing and meeting needs. That was me the next phrase. When he saw. He is our example, my friends. There is no one who lived this message of a love that sees and serves like Jesus. No one who modeled it like Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he says to his disciples that famous line, that's often just reserved for missions. It is mission, but it's fundamentally compassion. He says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus saw, and then he moved. His eyes took in needs, and it moved his heart. It, it grabbed him in his very heart, the center of his being. If you would just turn with me for a moment to Mark chapter 6. Please go there in your Bibles. Mark chapter 6. Great illustration of what we're talking about here. Mark chapter 6 and verse 30. Very familiar story. But I just want you to see the heart of Jesus. Not just the miracle. See the heart of Jesus in it. Verse 30 of Mark chapter 6. The Bible says, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. 
And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. It's very clear that they were tired. They were tired. They were weary. Pause. One of the excuses we might make for not responding to needs, maybe not even seeing needs, is that we are busy. You're so busy and we are so tired, right? Just note this text. These dudes are tired. Nothing wrong with rest. Jesus says, come away and rest. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Verse 32. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. 33. Now many saw them going. The people saw them going. They were like, "Uh uh-uh, you're not escaping. And recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Pause right here for a moment. What do you think the disciples thought? (laughs) I mean, you could put yourself there in that boat. The text says that Jesus saw the crowd And I'm guessing that they could see on his face. They could see in his eyes. He was going to go toward them. And they were like, oh, man. Can you just imagine? Be honest. Be honest. Man, Jesus. You know he's going to care for those people. They were tired, man. They just wanted some vacay. So he began to teach them many things. Verse 35. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, (laughs) they sort of acted like it was all about them, concerned for the people. This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And it seems reasonable, does it not? It seems totally reasonable. Jesus, it's getting late. They're probably really hungry, and we don't have anything to feed them with. Let them go. Stop teaching. Shut her down, Jesus. Verse 37, but he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. So many people. Can you just imagine them scattered across the hillside and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000. Men, perhaps upwards to 20,000 people, maybe. What do we see here? Jesus saw the need. It was a tangible one in this moment, a tangible one. He was going to feed them. He saw the need and he met the need. He used the disciples to do it. There's a lot going on here that I won't get into. Okay, a lot going on here. He's proving himself to his men. Um, Yeah, there's a lot that we could talk about. But fundamentally, what is it? It was an example, an example of Jesus seeing and meeting needs. He was moved with compassion for their soul. He also cared for their body. He cared for these people. And these were people that Jesus knew, my friends. He knew that they would turn on him. In John chapter 6, when this story is told, a couple of days later, these people all walk away. They all leave. Jesus says, is it just about the food for you guys? I'm here to help your soul. And they leave. He even gets to the point where he asks his disciples, will you leave as well? Dustin, why do you bring that up? I bring that up to say, look at his heart here. Jesus knew they would leave. Jesus knew how fickle they were. And still he cared for them. Still he cared for them. He did not make excuses. 
He saw a need and he met it. He saw needs and he met it. He went out of his way to help, to bless. My friends, what an example for us. Jesus, the pristine example of someone who saw and served. Someone who had eyes and hands. May the Lord give us that same heart. Alfred Edersheim wrote it this way. There could be no question of retirement or rest in view of this. In view of what? In view of the people coming. Edersheim says, Jesus couldn't consider rest in this moment. They were here. They were here. It was a call which came to him from his father. Even such opportunity was unspeakably precious to him. It was annoying to his men, but precious to him who longed to gather the lost under his wings. It was this depth of longing and intenseness of pity which now ended the Savior's rest and brought him down from the hill to meet the gathering multitude. What a blessing to see the heart of Jesus. So question, how do we respond to this? How do we respond? Number one, the question is, have you been born again? For remember, these are tests. The test of light and the test of love. Do you desire to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to live your life underneath the authority of the Word of God? And do you reflect His love to other people? John provides these as a test. Again, this is not fundamentally about behavior modification. This is about life transformation. Do you know Jesus? If so, if the answer this morning is yes, let me encourage you. Remember what you have. Remember what you have and who you've been given. Remember what you have. You've been given so much. So much. And remember who you've been given. You have the Spirit of Christ within you. There is no doubt that if you yield yourself to the Spirit of God, He is going to pull you towards needs. He's going to pull your heart to write the check. Pull your heart to make the meal. Pull your heart to open up your home. The question is, do we see? Do we serve? Now, finally, let me just encourage you. The only way, the only way in which we will actually see needs if we, is if we are actually engaged in community. The fundamental application of this text is within. Notice that in the language of brothers and sisters. It's not limited there, I don't think. Limited really just by the Spirit's direction of our lives. The fundamental application is to one another. Can I just encourage you? Join a small group. Dive into community. There you'll see needs, my friend. There you'll see needs. You have an opportunity to reach out and seek to meet those needs for the glory of God. True love is a love that's super. It's a love that's selfless. It's a love that sees. It's a love that serves. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Help us to live it out. We need you. God, we are so prone to be selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed. I pray that you would help us to have a gospel perspective. Father, help us to see needs, to be driven by your Spirit to meet those needs. In Jesus' name, amen.